one, we're uh, back to uh, the committee of the revision of the penal code on our second day of hearings uh, on enhancements. Uh, the way that we're going to um, handle today, the brief agenda for today is to uh, discuss uh, the ideas that came up yesterday in a hope to set priorities for committee staff. Um, so I'm gonna basically run through uh, the panels in order. I have a bunch of the ideas that came up. They were also in Tom's memo from uh, last week. And then um, hopefully I'd like to distill down to uh, five or six priorities. That doesn't mean that we're abandoning other ideas at all, but only the things that we want to further research at this time. Um, and then um, we will hear from Tom to update us on the research that he's done from our prior meetings. And then I think we have a few administrative issues. Is that right, Tom and Brian? Does that sound right in terms of, okay. Yep. So uh, let's just start, you know, and I think we want to move with some, yesterday was a long day. I think it was a lot accomplished. Again, I really want to thank Tom, especially for pulling all the witnesses together, stage managing everything. Um, there's a lot of logistics stuff, especially with the CDCR, and so I thought it, I thought it was really, really um, great. Um, to tick through some of the ideas, and um, I'm just going to go in order as the way that I remember them coming up, and if we could try to um, remember how we originally discussed about doing this in that you know, let's try to keep it to this, to each idea at a time uh, before moving on to the next. And uh, I guess at the end, we can kind of say, uh, hey, let's uh, star this one as a priority. Um, and um, we may or may not, and then we'll see what we got. Um, so I want to start with Governor Brown. Uh, he obviously came to the table with, um, a, pretty sweeping ideas that um, I'm not sure any of them are really discreet enough for the committee, at least at this time. Um, he planted, you know, several times said uh, about talking about uh, a voter initiative. I think that he thinks that is um, a, a potential avenue for us, not only because things that we might want to uh, look at require a voter initiative or two-thirds vote, but also I think that he found the experience of Prop 57 as a uh, as a decent vehicle, and I and I do think that uh, general public supports criminal justice reform in some ways more so than the legislature. So, um, but he talked about things that have generally come under the rubric of second look sentencing. Um, he talked about a program that came up a couple times that he started, which is under uh, Penal Code 1170D. This is actually something that we could look at that wouldn't require an initiative. This um, allows CDCR to nominate um, inmates for uh, resentencing. Um, it says that the, sec the secretary says this person, in my opinion, has been rehabilitated. Um, and can go back to court for basically to resentencing as status quo ante. The, the judge can decide to keep the same sentence. The only thing the judge can't do is lengthen the sentence, um, but the judge can also shorten the sentence. It doesn't change the count of conviction. It just um, as gives an opportunity to reduce uh, the person's sentence. Uh, to date, about 150 or 175 people have been chosen for this. About half of them have gotten uh, a reduced sentence. Um, I think it's actually something to look at. Um, My, it's not really an enhancement, but it came up. Yes, I, Senator just, Skinner. I think it's important to, uh, to indicate when CDCR got that power and to think about it in the context of that 150 and it's been a good number of years. So oh, it's it's been it's been my lifetime. Let's just put it that way. So, so I'll just give an example. I mean, we may have to do some more analysis before we could. I would love for that to be a good tool, but for example, in eighteen and nineteen total over those two years, the secretary submitted seventy nine names under eleven seventy D, 
And of those 79, I think there was less, uh, it was about 20 got their, their sentences reduced. So the parole boards, even with the secretary and CDCR's backing, the parole board rejected the vast majority. Right, it's not the parole board, it's the courts. Right, okay, sorry. Well, it was a com um, combo, combo. Com in some cases, in some cases. Um, there's a lot of implementation problems with that. I think that we could help clear up. I work very closely on this. We do a lot of these kind of cases. I'm happy to talk about them and maybe they should, we should add this to the agenda about parole because it's almost a quasi parole type situation. And we didn't really have a full briefing on this. Um, it, it, it's been on the books for, I, I was a little bit glib when I said it's been on the books for my lifetime. I think that that's almost true. Uh, it wasn't until 2018 that Governor Brown uh, put money into CDCR to actually do these cases and actually authorize the secretary to start uh, handing them out. Um, so depending on how you count, um, most of the cases of the 175 that have been uh, handed down to the courts, the ones that have been denied have actually just not been ruled on. Um, they're sitting fallow um, there's problems uh, in the courts. There's problems with the way that CDCR notifies the courts. They're sent actually snail mail to Los Angeles County Court addressed to the judge who handled the case 20 years ago, many of whom have moved on. Right. And you could imagine what the Los Angeles County Court clerk's office does with this. And so we, a lot of the work that we've done in my work at Stanford is just saying, hey, this is a big deal chance to look at this person's sentence again. Now you have discretion to avoid it, but let's at least uh, find the letter. And so many of them are getting just lost in translation, but that's a different issue. And maybe we should just add that to the agenda because I do think it deserves a um, um, close look. Um, and, and, and it's a good, it's a good way to reward, you know, as we talked about at, at the end, reward um, positive behavior. Um, and Michael, is this a separate uh, entirely from compassionate release, which, yes. which comes up? Yes. Yeah, because that's yes, another completely. another you know corollary type thing where I think it makes Correct. sense economically from, and you know just everything else would make sense. Separate from medical parole, separate from yeah. Um, it's it's just good conduct. Just this person right. has been rehabilitated, yeah. um, and is impressed, and it goes up the chain from warden to dep, you know to. Um, and, uh, and, and the ultimate, according to the regulations in CDCR, the ultimate recommendation from the secretary is that it's, their continued incarceration is no longer in the interest of justice. So yeah. he, now she, uh, would certify that that's the ultimate standard that they've, they've that they're, that's their conclusion, which I think is pretty powerful. And but, this is also distinct from the governor's power to commute a sentence. That's what happened in the old yes. days. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yeah. This is not, yeah. this is just a recommend, this just revests right. ju sentencing yeah. jurisdiction in the sentencing court. Yeah. That's all okay. it does. Okay. Um, uh, uh, with the weight, with the weight of CDCR behind yeah. it, which. Right. Correct. Um, so, all right. Mike, I, I had two concrete things that Jerry, that Brown mentioned. You, that, you can call uh, him Jerry. Go ahead. <laughs> I call him Gov, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, they, uh, you know, when I pressed him to try to get more specific, so the two things that I pulled out from what his comments towards the end were, he suggested on enhancements, two things, either making them discretionary or adding language that they only be applied in extraordinary circumstances. So that was one on enhancements. And then on, you know, he kept talking about earlier parole, earlier parole. So he, when I pressed him, he said, uh, uh, add some language or a framework to parole to, that would give guidance to the parole board. And he put specifically that it not focus on the initial offense, the crime, but rather that the assessment be based on how much the person has done the rehab. So those were the concrete things I got out of it. 
that's in fact the state of the law, right? I mean, they, they can't base a parole denial based on the the nature of the, the facts of the case. Yeah. That, that law developed over quite a long period of time. Sure. No. You can't base it alone on the, on the facts of the case. Uh, alone. Right. Which never changed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because they never changed. Now, uh, we are going to have a whole hearing on parole. So I think we will get to that. And it's very complicated. And I agree that it deserves a second look. Um, and uh, I was also encouraged by the governor uh, saying that that was something that we should look at. So at least for today, um, I mean, I am fully, <laughs> I don't want to uh, dismiss what you just said, Senator, but let's try to keep it to the enhancement piece to at least, at least have some focus to our conversation. Certainly, and, certainly. I just thought it was important to take the note that those were too concrete. I, I don't, well, he, uh, he, yeah. Yeah, he said a lot, of, he said a lot of things that I took, took his, his very strong encouragement. So, um, and, and I agree, parole. And, and that and it resonates actually, maybe I started getting us off topic with the second look sentencing in the 1170D. It's all in the same drifting towards some type of indeterminate scheme where at the, it's not just what's your sentence is set in stone from at trial, at some point later on have a, have a chance to um, earn your way out and, and or, um, reduce reduce one sentence or at least reevaluate the sentence um, at some later date. But I do think that the point you made about um, having enhancements um, be for extraordinary circumstances, uh, which he did mention, uh, there are a couple of ways that we might be able to approach that. Obviously, um, and as we'll and Tom, I, I hope you can jump in too, especially when we start hitting things that um, are would require a two thirds vote or uh, a voter initiative. Because I, um, my instinct is that we should try to avoid those issues. Um, meaning, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Senator Skinner or Assembly Member Kamlager, but a two thirds vote is a very, very heavy lift and maybe for our first set of recommendations, maybe avoid reforms that would require that. Or well, maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. It is very heavy lift, but I guess what I'd say is we should, we should not, uh, we should look, we should make our list and then evaluate because there may be some for which it, uh, we, that it is doable. So I think we make our list first and then we evaluate. I think that that's a good point well taken. I agree. But let's at least note, note where we're uh, stepping in yeah. deeper water. Um, he, I think uh, the governor, in fact, said something, maybe he even said, get rid of enhancements altogether. Uh, that's obviously something that we can't legally do without an initiative. But you know, he was, very, I think, very strong uh, skepticism of enhancements in general. Uh, were there other things from the governor's uh, talk that struck people, either specifics or in general? Well, in general, he said there were just too many codes. So I'm, yeah. I'm always encouraged by, you know, he said, make them simpler, trust the judges, take their meds and trust the judges, and then um, create norms. So I sort of was thoughtful around those things, because if we can just, I mean, even Steve Cooley has said we have too many penal, the penal yeah. code's too big. Yeah, and, and, and then I think another co uh, common theme throughout the day was the transparency or lack thereof, whether it was the Estes robberies or the gun enhancements on an ordinary robbery, right? that it's a robbery plus a gun enhancement, not an armed robbery. Um, I think the code, I think we all agree is uh, a real cobweb. Um, and and I, probably part of our mission is to not just simplify it, but to understand it and weave our way through it because it is so uh, complicated. But I, I was really appreciated his time. I think he fully supports our general trajectory. And uh, I think we can hopefully rely on him on, as an ally and a continued resource is my takeaway. Um, before we move on, is there other things that um, people want to say about Governor Brown's presentation? Hmm. All right, um, getting on to the, the panelists, in some ways the first panel had the most substantive, I think, 
uh, suggestions, and a lot of them tracked with what was already in Tom's memo. So I'd like to tick through some of the ideas, and uh, I think maybe almost 15 or 20 ideas came up, um, and I think our job is to try to star or prioritize um, what we would like further research and development on. Even if it's a good idea, it might not rise to the top of our, our list. Um, so um, one of the ideas that came up was to revive the idea that um, uh, enhancement must be limited to doubling the base term. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, you want to give us a little history about that and where the, the, the yeah. legislation stands on that? So, well, I don't think there's, there was legislation, and I think Senator Skinner, you probably know better, may remember better than I do, um, a few years ago that tried to bring that back into the penal code and um, hasn't yet been successful. It was uh, a limit that was created in the penal code, I think, around in the 70s when the determinate sentencing came into vogue. But then, as often happens, the uh, California Supreme Court said, well, in this situation, it doesn't apply. In this situation, it doesn't apply. In this situation, it doesn't apply. And then after a few years, there were, there was more exceptions than there was rules. So uh, it sort of got judicially undercut. And then I think it was formally repealed. The uh, big caveat or the big issue with it, I think, is uh, what you're talking about, Mike, with the enhancements that are created by initiative. A lot of them are mandatory. So there, I don't. I think there'd be issues about saying this mandatory enhancement has a limit on it and the limit was done by a majority vote in the legislature when that was so that'd be that idea of you're prohibiting something the initiative allowed so it would apply to a lot of enhancements but i believe and i would want to look into it a lot more the big enhancements would not be covered by it essentially so three strikes nickel priors and the gang enhancements so remind us by volume three strikes get which were, which are the big ones Three strikes, five year nickel prior, as it's called. Those are both initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, gun enhancements and sort of, you know, different varieties of the gun enhancements, but an umbrella term would be gun enhancements. Great bodily injury uh, and gang enhancements mm -hmm. are the, the ones that the data I've been able to find, which is from 2016, so not, you know, super recent um, and only from the prison population. Those are the ones that are most used. And I think the research that, uh, Professor Weisberg did shows that unsurprisingly, those are the ones that drive the most incarceration as well. Yeah. So I, I was, you know, struck by this idea that with enhancements, you know, that's the tail wagging the dog so many often. And I, and I, you know, this was, came up from Jeff Rosen that, that, that he, he thinks that that's an error and that there should be some the reason why double the base term makes some sense to me is that it's at least tied to the severity of the base term, right? If you have a relatively minor base term, you're enhanced, if you're enhanced, it can't be, you know, 10 times what the relatively minor base term is, but it, you know, it doubles the sentence, which could be extraordinary. Um, I don't know what other people thought about that yeah. with the caveats that we said before. Yeah, you know, this is like, this is Sort of before my time a little bit, I remember going to uh, uh, judicial seminars on, on sentencing. And as Tom pointed out, I mean, there were so many exceptions. There was one judge who was the, the guru on sentencing. And you practically needed a computer. to, And all judges have kind of a sentencing cheat sheet in front of them. But to figure it out and then to do the double the base term was like, it kind of eliminated all the work you had done. And I, I don't think judges liked it, but you know, who am I? I'd never had to really uh, live under that regime. Uh, so uh, I think you might get some resistance from, from the California Judges Association, just that it requires a lot of calculations and, and it's confusing. So that's just my off the top of my head thought. On, it is a it is a band-aid on top of a band-aid on top of a band-aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many steps. Senator so, Skinner. So it was a Bradford bill in 2018 that would have done exactly that, which is just double the base term, and it failed miserably yeah. on the assembly floor. I'm trying to. I'm looking it up right now. Yeah. Was that in Was that in 18? 
Yes, I think the DAs opposed it. Yeah. So I, I think that might have been my first year. Mm -hmm. And it went from like 24 votes to like nine. Yeah. Well, even the public defender yesterday just said, you know, the, the life aspect on the gun enhancement anyway is just too much. He wanted right. to that she down. did say that. So that's probably more palatable. Right. We'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to that. I just wanted this double the base term idea. Okay. Was the Bradford bill a two thirds <clears throat> vote? No. No. So I it would have just. And I think ahead, it didn't apply to violent offenses, if I remember uh, cor correctly. I remember reading it, there was a lot of stuff carved out. Um, and even with that, it still suffered this fate. Sometimes it's politics, sometimes it's author, sometimes it's a whole bunch of other stuff. So I don't, no. I'm not going to say I'd count no, it out. Right. We can't read that as 100% that it would pass, but it certainly. Um, it doesn't vote well. Got it. All right, I'm moving on, unless there are other people who want to talk about double the base term idea. Yep. Well, I, I want to say, you know, we also might have an opportunity given the fact that I guess there's a new prosecutors association that's developed or, so yes. that could also provide alternative voices to oh. support whatever you know comes out of the commission so i just share that as a a sprig of hope <laughs> absolutely absolutely i think i hope what i hope for at least for this initial conversation is that we try to focus on ideas that we think are good sort of what senator skinner was saying i guess i'm talking in, out of both sides of my mouth first i said don't talk about things at two-thirds vote but i agree with senator skinner let's try to figure out what are good ideas first and then we'll see you know talk about politics later but i agree that there is an interesting development there with the progressive da's uh, association mm -hmm. um, and of course things will change dramatically could change dramatically depending on the outcome of the da race in los angeles mm -hmm. um, so um there was another suggestion about um limiting and i think this is also from uh jeff rosen um pick one enhancement, right? Um, per, per case or per count. Right. Um, I don't know if people had thought that that mm -hmm. was a better or worse or if that resonated with other folks. Mm -hmm. Peter? I don't know if it's better or worse, but I made a note to myself this morning that I wanted to talk about and find out. Okay, go ahead. Tell well, me I mean, just that it, I thought it was interesting that, that you tell the prosecutors, okay, you've got 20 enhancements you can use here quickly. Pick your best enhancement and then let's go because, you know, the, the options, I mean, you, sometimes the enhancements are, you know, Carlos can tell you they outnumber the charges. It's yeah. enhancement after enhancement. And then I just wanted to ask, and I know we've already talked about this, but the five year prior was, um, that's a voter approved enhancement. I'd sure like to see, I don't necessarily think we need to get rid of it, but if we can make it discretionary so that judges have the discretion to strike it in the interest of justice. I mean, there were more than one case. I had more than one case, one that I remember in particular because Father Greg was a witness at the sentencing where it really cried out for state prison, but it didn't cry out for the 19 years or whatever, you know, so I put the guy on probation. I'm not, I'm not adding all these enhancements. I'm, I'm putting him on probation. Of course, the DA's head exploded and, and ran up to the 19th floor. And they, but they didn't appeal me. They, they, I mean, they had a, I think they had a sense ultimately it was the right thing to do. So we can make the five-year prior discretionary somehow. And I recognize that's a two-thirds vote. And I just wonder if it is, could be on the, the list of we'd like to do it. Is it viable? Um, that list because that would change a lot of I think a lot of the way plea agreements are handled. Totally. Well, I will, Go ahead. Senator. I was going to say one of my takeaways from Governor Brown was he mentioned ballot initiative more than once. So I do feel like it was his subtle way of encouraging us to think about what's good and what we should do and not be afraid of having to go to the ballot. Um, 
so I just that's my thumbs up to you, Judge. And I'd, I'd also add, uh, Judge Espinosa, the, that discretion actually was restored to the judges in 2019. So okay. re that change was made. It, actually repealing um, the enhancement is an initiative issue, but giving okay. the judges under 1385, that, that was done by majority vote. So that, oh, that's good. back. So it'll be interesting oh. to see how it plays out. But correct me if I'm wrong, that's only prospective only, is that correct? That's Tom? right, that's right. Yeah. So that's another thing And didn't thing that someone we... say that that wasn't really being used a lot? Wasn't, didn't I hear that yesterday? I think there is a discussion in general about 1385, which is the, what the judges used to do it, but it came up um, in the gang enhancement context about when the gang enhancement uh, is struck and that doesn't happen too often, which, you know, does that mean the right balance is struck in the first place, so you don't sort of need that escape valve, or is something not going right with the escape valve? It's that's sort of two different ways to think about it. Um, and that's also a you know an empirical data question that we're going to try to figure out because, right, there has been a bunch of laws that have given judges more discretion, but if they're just if they're not using it, um, we need to figure out. And maybe it's not just discretion, but presumptions. But this is also later down on, on my list. I'm just trying to take through things and, and keep us uh, a little bit focused. But uh, but the pick one example, um, you know, pick one enhancement, I, I think it was from another state, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong. For example, uh, using great bodily injury and a gun in the same case, right, that often goes hand in hand. Um, and that would make sense to say, you know, pick one of those. Um, and, and that used to be the law in California, too. You could sort of, you, you had to pick, it was limited to those particular enhancements, but those are extremely common examples. So there's precedent for that here, too, as well. Um, and, I, and I would say on the pick one, too, Mike, is it's similar issues um, with the double the base term, where some of these enhancements are phrased as mandatory, they're passed by initiative, so you have a, a similar, you know, limit on how far the a majority vote in legislature could go with it. But, and you know, technically three strikes and things like that aren't enhancements, they're alternative sentencing schemes. So we'd have to be careful about how we phrased it. Um, but it, it gets very complicated, but that's okay. That's good. That's what we're here for. <laughs> um, all right, before we move on to pick one, and at the end, I'm gonna have to circle back and we're gonna have to sort of, you know, pick ones that, you know, we wanna prioritize. Anything more about the pick one idea? Okay. Uh, the Estes robberies and the aggravated shoplifting idea. I was wondering if people felt that that was um, resonated with them. It's not technically an enhancement, but we talked about it for some amount of time yesterday. You know, I, I think some kind of codification of, of that case is, I mean, is warranted. I mean, it's been around such a long time and you know, I think just adding a subpart to 484, you know, in certain instances that reflect an Estes situation, some kind of enhanced sentence or minimum sentence or- As a misdemeanor? As, as a misdemeanor, yeah. Because I think what, as, as we learned, you know, a lot of these things are not really, in a sense, intentional. <laughs> They're just sort of part of the facts in terms of resisting, uh, the escape and no one's really really injured uh, so yeah I, I just think a modification of the petty theft code uh, could address that in a reasonable way so that it's not a strike it's not a robbery it's just an aggravated petty theft and I don't want to sound like a broken record but um, I, I really want to uh, take a shot at addressing the intersection of serious mental illness and these Estes robberies. Yeah, because yeah. We see a lot of them in LA, and these people yeah. aren't capable of reacting like you or I when we get caught doing yeah. something wrong. Yeah. Um, that would prohibit the filing of, an, of a strike offense against someone who's hyper serious mental illness. In yeah. This. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you word it. I don't know. <laughs> but I just would really like to try to address that. And I, you know, I. Go ahead. I think there's also an important intersection with, with, you know, with poverty, with homelessness, with all of that. So mm -hmm. there's a difference. And I listened to the DA 
Um, you know, there's a difference between, you know, me, for example, deciding, hey, for kicks, I'm going to go rob someone or rob a store and use a weapon. Um, and then someone who hasn't eaten for five days is homeless, has a mental illness, you know, I don't know, you know, all of those, all of the things you hear, all of the stories about the woman who stole because she needed diapers for the baby. I, I and I don't know how you include that in there. Yeah. Um, but we, I, we, I don't just think we can disregard that. Yeah. I agree a lot. I, I completely, I see a, a fair amount of it. There are people who are, uh, you know, Prop 20 is talking about, you know, these organized retail theft gangs, you know, that are actually, you know, trying to, uh, yeah. uh, diff different from the typical shoplifter. Robbery is extraordinarily broad definition of a, of a crime, which is part of the, the problem, I think, that we're um, dancing around here. I think it could use some clarity. We. Um, it's also an area that's very difficult. It, it's, it's, it lacks a lot of transparency. So we see all these robbers in prison and we don't know who is a, a robber in the, you know, in, the, in the more traditional sense and who is more, one of these more Estes type, type robberies. It's very hard to parse that out. Um, even when we do get the data, um, we did hear yesterday that in some counties, oh, these are never charged as robberies. And then in LA, oh, they're very frequently charged. You know, no. at least they're threatened. You know, the question is if, if they're at least threatened as right. robberies, you know, that creates the plea dynamic, which of course the vast majority of cases are resolved by plea. So even if it no. is ultimately not resolved as a robbery, the threat, no. uh, uh, Carlos? Yeah, I, you know, maybe things have changed in the <laughs> LA Superior Court, but. I don't remember getting a lot of Estes situations filed as robberies. I mean, it would be a petty theft, a little aggravated, and you wouldn't just, you know, you'd be imposed a little, uh, an enhanced sentence on a misdemeanor. Uh, you know, first time petty theft, you know, might be just a fine or community service, but if there was some kind of resistance a la Estes, maybe it'd be a 15 day sentence. But the DA would bring that to your attention. And I can't imagine, at least back in my day, and Peter, you can address this, uh, you know, a DA, if you just impose a sort of a sentence that takes into effect that there was some kind of resistance, whether it's mental health or, or something else, uh, I can't imagine a DA, uh, I mean, it'd be a, negoti a no negotiated plea to like a lesser count and dismiss the robbery if they had the gut, the, the gall to file a robbery. But I just don't, I can't even remember right now one where a case was so aggravated that they filed a robbery on, a, on a, what, what is really a petty theft. And she said that the judges don't, you know, don't use their common sense and they just uh, uh, accede to what the DA has filed. I mean, have times changed that much? I can't answer the I can't answer yeah. the spinelessness of the current yeah. bench in LA County question, yeah. but I I will yeah. say that the Estes robberies are fairly common. I I think, you know, um, yeah. Anyways, I, it, many times they're negotiated for um, grand theft persons or yeah, whatever right. it is, they, but they stay as felonies, and yeah, there really should be some way to keep that from happening. And I didn't mean yeah. to suggest that the LA bench is spineless. I'm just saying yeah. I, I can't address that because. I, I've been away from the bench for five years, and I the, the bench has b been undergoing this amazing transformation under Governors um, Brown and Newsom, yeah. um, becoming much more sort of um, progressive and criminally yeah. justice yeah. Uh, reform. We have a very strong bench in LA, is what I meant to say. I should have yeah. worded that differently. Yeah. We have a very strong bench in LA, and and they, um, I would not say that the district attorney's office has. Um, unlimited or unreasonable um, influence over yeah. the way the way things are done there. But the problem is, is they do have the um, sole discretion on what gets filed. Um, yeah. And th that, that, that impacts a lot of. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think if a weapon is you, the guy pulls a knife or something. Yeah. That would be a righteous as this robbery, petty theft. But if there's no, you know, deadly weapon like that, just a struggle. It's right. still a misdemeanor in, in my view. 
and maybe a little um, aggravated sentence, but that's it. I think that, listen, I, I think this is, uh, I, I just starred this as something that we should definitely come back yeah. and look at, look at yeah. other states. I think that uh, Professor Weisberg's idea of, you know, who initiates the contact, how the, it all works out. Sure. I'm curious yeah. about how it works in other states. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I was wondering is with Prop 47 making uh, uh, shoplifting a mandatory misdemeanor, removing it from a wobbler, I'd be curious to see if robberies went up as a way to charging around the Prop 47 mandatory misdemeanor shoplifting. Yeah. That would be one way to kind of get a little bit of a sense of what's going on. But it's yeah. going to be difficult to get some empirical data on this. But yeah. um, I agree, especially focusing to, to the extent we want to think about uh, street crimes, crimes of poverty, overwhelmingly disproportionate people of color, mental health issues, shoplifting, or aggravated shoplifting, however we want to describe it, yeah. seems to be yeah. uh, in our wheelhouse. And probably uh, a large number of cases, um, although a short, short, for the most part, relatively short punishments. Um, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, but maybe just one, one final thing. Of maybe course. you do the. Uh... I remember my first week on the Superior Court downtown, appointed by Pete Wilson, no less. Uh, there was a kind of a discharging of a weapon inside a house, a guy's retrieving his property, felony. And I said, and I just come from seven years in Compton. I said, this is a Compton misdemeanor. What are you telling me? You know, so there's a lot of Oh, yeah. Cultural differences within the court. I mean, in terms of what I saw in Compton, this was a misdemeanor. No one's injured. The guy's taking back his property under right of possession or whatever. And he, you know, acts a little unreasonable. But it didn't merit a felony. Uh, and I, and I, got along, I got along downtown, you know. Uh, so I just think judges have to have to put more pressure on the DA. And they, the culture... They won't take you up on appeal on a matter where you've exercised your discretion and have a good reason for it. The cultural differences within the 12 geographic districts are amazing. Yeah, amazing, I mean, yeah. Between the, the Antelope Valley and Compton and yeah. the East District. Pomona. Yeah. Pomona. Uh, there are no, a lot what, of... <laughs> one of my favorite uh, data points uh, is that there are the same number of trial judges in LA County as in the entire federal judiciary. Yeah. Well, uh, so uh, in any event, I don't want to get too far afield. Uh, I do think that uh, the aggravated shoplifting is something that we need to revisit. Yeah. Um, so the next item on my list, and this is something I'm going to be particularly interested in what the judges have to say here, is trying to put some um, what we're calling maybe guided discretion into 1385. So just as a refresher, 1385 allows judges to dismiss um, enhancements, to dis dismiss priors um, in the interest of justice. Uh, there's plenty of cases that say that the interest of justice is a uh, quote unquote amorphous concept. Um, there's really not um, any more guidance into it than that. Um, some examples of ways that you might be able to put guidance into it, I'm not saying that these are things that we would want to propose at all, is for uh, if the prior is more than X years old or was committed as a juvenile, then it's presumptively in the interest of justice to strike it, something like that. Um, this might get to towards Governor Brown's only in extraordinary circumstances idea for enhancements. Um, I was wondering, I'm gonna start bouncing it off the judge's ideas if this is something that 1385 would be, would be helpful to judges, is it hurtful to judges? We're still obviously keeping discretion, but it would, I guess, creating presumptions in certain circumstances. Well, I think it'd be a great idea because it is so uh, amorphous and you're always treading on, on thin ice if you do exercise that discretion. So some kind of guidance, I think, in the statute uh, would be very helpful uh, for the judges. As I recall, there are very few 
cases on 1385. Right. Uh, so, well, more Romero, just, Romero is the big one, right? That's sure. Yeah. That, allows. That, that was, a, you know, a landmark decision. So, yeah. I, I think language that that instructs judges that um, the language only in extraordinary circumstances, something that, that guides them towards exercising their discretion more freely, yeah. uh, would be helpful because judges are always looking for some support for exercising their discretion. Yeah. I, I agree with Carlos. There's not a lot of guidance or direction yeah. for when and, and 1385 Tom, is appropriate. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, is this the way that um, the nickel prior issue was amended? So the nickel prior was passed by a voter initiative, would have required a two third vote, but they have amended it in that they've provided the discretion by enhancing 1385 rather than touching the the substantive statute of the nickel prior. So this is a way that might be able to address some of these issues by giving discretion, more discretion, sentencing discretion back to the judge's hands. That's right. I think that dynamic and Romero itself are, you know, very strong authority that, um, you know, the judge's discretion is independent of the initiative nature of the enhancement itself. Um, Assemblymember Kamlanger, did you have a thought about this? Um, well, I was really interested in what the judges were saying. I had pulled it up and um, I definitely feel like sort of more guidance is probably necessary. I was, many of my notes throughout the course of yesterday were just how sort of arbitrary um, things are across the state, you know, within different districts, how you're using, um, you know, 1385 more often than not, et cetera, et cetera. I guess I was also struck by the fact that it's, um, you know, this has to be um, requested by the prosecutor. Right, yeah. Yes and no. Yeah, there is no motion to dismiss, as I recall. No, there's no, there's no motion to dismiss. But for example, in the Romero context and three strikes context, uh, it's a I think mostly styled as an invitation for the judge to exercise right. their authority. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. it's very much filed by the defense. Uh, so it's not a it's not technically a motion. But but I you're you're correct. But, but making that clear, I think um, you know everyone knows the workaround. But there's no reason that the penal code shouldn't reflect that reality. I think. I mean, whether it would make a difference, but I mean, why not at least have the penal code be real? And there's yeah. some value in that. No, certainly, and, and goes directly to the clarity part of our mission. I think the value of that is it, it, it would encourage judges to use 1385. It would make it clear to them: look, use this. We want you to use this. Mm -hmm. And I also so, want to keep our focus on public safety and that judges have an, have an important role in public safety and should be trusted with in, in public safety and not just the, the prosecutors are the only people advocating for public safety of the community. Um, so. I and so then I, 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 I had another question about it. Um, yes. So like once a dismissal happens through 1385, um, are there still multiple bites at the apple that I, I, I it's a great question and it gets very complicated because a judge can do two things and i don't know how many people including some judges are aware of the differences are they can strike the enhancement and it essentially erases it for every purpose or they can just strike the punishment Right. So you can't add any time but it's still there for credit earning and for use in the future right, right. It's, someone still has a gang enhancement on their record, so to speak, but they don't get any additional punishment for it. So um, there's some cells, so the judge can make that decision. And um, what I've heard anecdotally is that that perhaps isn't understood with the pre precision we would, we would want it to be by everyone, because it can be very- so, Did everybody just freeze? No. We're I've also heard that people can kind of languish um, in jail because there's like, I don't want to say limbo, but because there are sort of subsequent opportunities for folks to come up with other charges, that that also creates a problem? It, 
it, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd want to um, see some concrete examples to, to think about. But for example, this ties into to what uh, CDCR was saying when they go to the classification committee about where they're housed. If the enhancement is struck just for that limited purpose, CDCR sees it, I believe, as, you know, um, in its full effect. So it can really reverberate mm -hmm. across uh, someone's life, even if they get the immediate benefit of a shorter sentence, too. Um, I don't Better. know if this was brought up in apologies, I had to take a call that I've been waiting for for a few days. Um, in the, there was a, um, there was many, many enhancements were passed well before we did realignment. And most of the language in the enhancement statutes was explicit that you had to serve your, the time of your enhancement must be served. It said state prison. It didn't just say serve, it said state prison. So even though under realignment, you may have been in a situation where you were put in a county jail, because of that language, you were put in state prison. So in this budget that we adopted and has been signed, we fixed that, we, we made it conform to um, the realignment statute. So for those enhancements that weren't uh, under, a, under the proposition, all the others that weren't a two thirds vote will now, um, you, you would not be required to spend it in state prison if you otherwise under realignment would be going to county jail. So that's a fix that was just done. And I, I can- That's interesting. It was a great fix. My, my understanding of it is that its impact is limited a little bit because some enhancements make the underlying offense a strike, which then under realignment because it's a strike, has to go to prison. So it's sort of so it, a middle step. It. Um, yeah. I mean, it was. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, we did the best we could. But anyway, absolutely. But what would be helpful is to have some as we evaluate what we can, what we, uh, what's possible or what's appropriate to do around enhancement to factor that so we understand how that impacts. All right. And, um, and the other thing I wanted to ask, since I had to step out, is did we sure. already go through <coughs> specifics of either what Rosen, Roth, or some of the other um, folks that spoke to us yesterday, we already identify the things that they... Um, we have talked about um, yes and no. We didn't identify... Well, so for example, uh, Jeff Rosen suggested maybe doubling the base term, which we talked about or pick one enhancement, which is something I think that we were interested in. We just talked about uh, the Estes robberies, the aggravated shoplifting idea, which I've starred as something it seems that we, it seems to be consensus to, to rise the top of our um, review list. And then we just finished a conversation or closing on um, it, it putting more guidance into 1380, section 1385, which- I wanna, allows, go, I wanna go back to uh, Rosen for a minute. There was of course. Another, another thing that I have in my notes that he referenced, which is, mm -hmm. um, uh, and he said that his office is now doing this, restricting gang enhancements to misdemeanors. Yes, we, we will. That's up later on my list when we get right. done. So anyway, I just wanted to get it in our list. And then he also uh, referenced um, putting an upward limit on total time enhancement could oppose, impose. Right, like a double the base term or... Well, yeah, that was one specific. One specific was double the base term. The other was an upward limit. Right, he threw in a bunch of stuff. He said also maybe we should cut all sentences by 20% across the board. I mean, he was... He did say that too. Yeah. Um, interesting though on the doubling of the base terms that the DA Association was one of the... That four, four opposition for that bill were sheriffs, police chiefs, uh, NDAs and, and LADA. You know, I think that I, I've known, uh, you know, Jeff is the DA for Stanford uh, or County. Um, and so I've known him for quite a while. And um, he is in has feet in both worlds. I think that he, um, some of the progressive movement resonates with him and he's trying to adopt some of that, but at the same time, um, well, some, some of his things. And then at the same time, uh, he's also remains 
uh, active and a participant in the DA's association. And, and, and I hopefully he and perhaps some others can be a bridge because I, I think that finding some consensus in some of these is really going to be our best chance. And ideally is what you know, I, I, I'm shooting for. Listen, I don't want to say that we won't stand on principle when there are important battles to be fought, but let's at least try to find um, some areas where we might agree with. And he said some pretty, I think, out, I mean, cutting all prison sentences by 20% is not a small idea. Um, so let's give him some credit for that, I think. We give him some credit. I was on a thing later on in the evening and it was interesting because some of those folks, attendees were at, had attended our committee hearing and it was interesting to kind of hear their thoughts. But for 1385, mm -hmm. how many times can that be used? 1385 being, uh, remind me. So 1385, just to refresh, to bring you up to speed real quick, Senator, said 1385 is the judge's discretion at sentencing to strike sentence enhancements, to strike ah. priors, to strike, okay. right. um, and right now it is wide open. It says in the interest of justice and the leading Supreme Court cases on what that means says it means what it, that it means what it, it is what it is right. Uh, right. that it's an amorphous concept there's no guidance to it and so for example I think you also missed you could put in guidance that said something like if you're basing it on a prior that's 10 years old it's presumptively in the interest of justice to strike it but right now it's wide open this was also the way that the legislature was able to um, address the five-year nickel prior enhancements by giving judges discretion to strike the nickel prior uh, under 1385 without amending the initiative. So that's where 1385 comes from. And Assemblymember Member Well, so I was just wondering if maybe we could limit the number of times that it can be used or if there's some thought about that because essentially you are still sort of, the prosecution is, so this is what I've heard from talking to folks. They still kind of, you're using it as an opportunity to still find the charge that's gonna, like the thing that you can use. And so in some instances I've heard of um, it being used as a way to kind of, you know, beat down witnesses, weed them out, you kind of wear down the system. Eventually folks want to take a plea. Um, people don't necessarily want to be stuck in this kind of cycle. And so maybe you, you kind of limit the number of times that you can use it um, to at no, least create not, a little, no, am I wrong? I'm not, I'm not following limiting yeah. the number of times judges can- Well, how often, how often can, um, a process, the prosecution requests of 1385, I guess is the question. 1385 is only to reduce uh, sentences. Right. So if you have a case and it says that the prosecution, it's at the request of the prosecution, they can only request it once. So the way that 1385, and judges, uh, please interrupt if I'm doing this uh, incorrectly, is the way that 1385 works in practice is that the defense suggests or invites the court to exercise their authority under 1385 to strike X, whatever enhancement might be. It. And it, it can only be used to reduce a punishment that has been um, charged. But it doesn't it cannot, dismiss a case. It just, it's, it's, only about it's only about sentences and enhancements. Right. It does not dismiss the underlying charges. And as Tom was saying before, sometimes it only dismisses the punishment but keeps the enhancement actually in place. And you could do it at a judge's, and maybe this could be more explicit too, that it could, so a judge could, we could make it more explicit that the actual enhancement is struck altogether versus just the punishment which is struck. Um, it, is, it, is, it is one of these wide open uh, areas um, that there's a lot of flexibility, but it can only decrease uh, a punishment. And, and it only impacts the case that, that the judge is exercising his discretion on. The very next time the person gets arrested, that prior is going to show up on the, on the file. Line. So it's not, it's not used like it as a away. negotiating tactic. I, 
I think it, it, it can be, but it's, um, you know, you, it's not a reliable one because you're relying on a judge to make a decision and then you would go back to the prosecutor to say, okay, now we have this enhance, en enhancements that struck, let's make a deal now. My, my impression is that um, it's not, doesn't have much use there because it, it tends to come at the end of a case. But my impression and, and, also in the negotiations is that if the prosecution is willing to strike the strike, they strike it on their own yeah. with it before it even gets to the judge. So it's judges, uh, we're monopolizing here. What's your experience? <laughs> Who, me? No, no the, judges. the judges. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I was waiting for. I, I, I agree, Michael. It's usually, at least in the instances I had it, uh, the defendant would just admit or not admit, and you would take the plea without, it's usually with the agreement of the prosecution, not the have an admission taken of the of the enhancement. I think it's very rare for a judge really to to strike it on on invitation. Um, I'm, I can't remember any case where I did it. Uh, not that it isn't possible, uh, but usually part of a negotiated plea is what I'm saying. I I, I want to try to keep us moving a little bit. The one exa exception that I can show that I know of is that in some counties uh, under three strikes, they feel like they are required by statute to charge the full three strike sentence. And then prosecutors then do ask for uh, yeah. exercise discretion under Romero. That's yeah. a little bit of a, a legal fiction. But um, so that does happen in some instances and maybe creating some of the uh, issues that we're talking about, but for the most part, I, 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 I in any event, I'm starring this as something that we that that should require should deserve further research. Um, Can I ask uh, one more question before we move on, Mike? Yes. Um, we suppose, I think the only specific factor we talked about was uh, length of time, which I think is a great place to start because there's precedent for that in the penal code in other states. It's a you know common way to think about old convictions. Um, but I, and I'd, I'd be curious if folks have thoughts about other specific ones just while we're, we're speaking about this. Two that occur to me are things that um, we spoke about yesterday and today. I mean, Judge Espinosa, I think if the 1385 specifically said, you know, someone's mental health condition, either at the time of this offense or the prior offense should be taken into account, that probably is the subject of lots of uh, 1385 motions already, but having in the statute might be helpful. And yeah. similarly, you know, uh, Assemblymember Kamlager talked about the Racial Justice Act yesterday. I think you could have language s similar in there. You know, we talk about these gang enhancements that are 92% of the people who have them are, are uh, people of color. That could be part of 1385 explicitly, too. I'm not saying that should be something we recommend, but I think there's the space to include a lot of these things that we're talking about as issues when we're sort of guiding discretion just to say, you know, Your Honor should, should think about this when, when it's making this decision. Mm -hmm. space for that. You know, just one final point that just occurred to me, this motion to Smith works both ways. The judge <clears throat> does not have to grant a prosecution motion to dismiss in the prosecution's view <clears throat> that it's in the interest of justice. Just look at the Michael Flynn case mm -hmm. and what's going on in, in, in New York or DC, wherever the case is. And the, the, the leading case here in LA County was the Hillside Strangler case where uh, Ron George, when he was in Department 100, head of criminal refused to grant the AG's motion, well, the DA's motion, John Vandekamp, to dismiss that case for lack of evidence. And he assigned the case to the uh, attorney general, the attorney general obtained conviction. So, wow. you know, the federal statute says with leave of the judge or leave of the court, which gives the court discretion. So, I mean, it does work both ways. So we do recommend amending the statute to give guidance at, to give discretion to the court, just bear in mind that it applies both ways. I also want to add that the you know interest of justice also says nothing explicitly about public safety, which again cuts both ways, right? Um, and I think that that could be an area that we want to you know emphasize. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm I'm starring this as something that we need to come back and, and revisit because it's obviously a lot of so some of the other things that we've. Uh, touched on, so I'm going to go through quickly, is uh, Jeff Rosen mentioned 20% cut across the board. Um, that, you know, is obviously sweeping reform, would probably require initiative. 
Um, but it's something that I think will be a subject in some ways of a, a future uh, meeting where we're probably going to talk about credits and there's you know ways to achieve something similar to what he suggested perhaps with uh, credit reform and it's in fact already going on and in, in, in credits in many ways but there are ways that CDCR has opportunities to uh, use credits that might achieve a similar result. Um, one of the other uh, items that we've touched on that is in Tom's memo is that there are a couple of reforms that have been enacted uh, but apply prospectively only um, and should those be applied retroactively and those particular are uh, drug prior convictions, uh, jail prior stays, and uh, the nickel priors. Um, all of those are recent reforms passed by the legislature, but they're all perspective only. Um, I was wondering if people had thoughts about um, applying those retroactively. Well, I mean, it makes sense. And it seems, seems fair to me, just as a general sort of notion that if you were prosecuted under a statute that um, is no longer considered viable or fair that maybe we should take a look at how you ended up where you are. Um, I don't know how, I don't know what that would look like if it would be a bill to make that retroactive. Um, do we have a sense of what, for example, what the use of drug priors going backwards would do to the state prison population, eliminating them? Did, I didn't ask that question very well, but would we get a lot of people, would a lot of people be released as a result? It would be great um, information to uh, for us to have. So the the short answer is is no, and that's something that um, our data project, one of the like most obvious things we we'd want to be able to get an answer to. The little bit of info I have is that going f in between for about a year between 2015 and 2016, that repeal affected. 2.3% of the people entering CDCR. So that's just on the drug um, piece of it. So that may have been a weird year and that maybe it had a bigger effect, um, you know, on jail cases or something like that. But I think the drug one is uh, particularly small. The one year prison prior is huge by compare, you know, for contrast. And Mike, in that list too, was uh, the some of the gun enhancements also uh, judges were granted discretion to strike those in a way they hadn't had before. So that would be on the list. And the, the other distinction I would make is some are automatic and some add that discretion back to the judge. So the pathway to retroactive application for both of those would, would be, I think, different. Some would be sort of automatic and some would involve, I think, a little bit more work by a, a superior court judge. Could we, little, could we include in our data collection, um, it's, on, it's on this same thread, uh, taking um, those legislative actions we've done, so you, you've referenced a few of them, but take, take um, the whole list of them and look at if we were to make them uh, retroactive, what that would impact. And I raise it because, for example, um, the bill I did on felony murder, I allowed for it to be even those who have already been charged and were serving. And so, uh, but there were many others, as, as you've now referenced, that did not, that changed it going forward, but did not uh, change or affect those people who are already convicted of that particular whatever thing. So it would, it would be helpful, but the data would be helpful. Senator Skinner, are you tracking the data on, the, on, the, on your reform and, and their retroactivity? Kind of anecdotally, though it's a good number of people that have already been uh, resentenced, so. Good. All right. We, we should know. I mean, we, we've been tracking it on Proposition 36 and 47, which, which does uh, do it, but it's, it's, it's important to track. It's important to track by county how it's being used. Um, I, I have a question for the judges. Um, do you think judges uh, would like or resist the opportunity to revisit old cases after some period of time? Uh, 
I don't know. I'm kind of neutral on that. I, my, my sense is they would not like it. Just more work, basically. Uh, and the law was the law at the time. And maybe like the felony murder situation, but I, wholesale, it looks like it'd be a lot of cases coming back and they would have no independent recollection of, of the circumstances and what kind of guidance would they have to resentence? Uh, I, I don't know. Putting the workload question aside, let's assume that we could. Yeah. Because I, I think the workload question is a legitimate one, right? We don't want to yeah. add it, you know, but just, yeah. is, this, is this a good role for judges? Or no, that's, this is a role for parole boards. It's a different skill set. It's a different group of people. Or no, this is a good role for judges to, to come back. I, I've, it's, I've always been curious about this. And I don't, of course, you can't speak for the entire judiciary, but I was curious about your thoughts on it. Yeah. Well, LA has an unusual experience in that they've centralized a lot of this work, right? So, yeah. for example, all the habeas petitions for uh, parole denials were, are centralized in Department 100. Um, all the Prop 36 requests for resentencing were centralized. So they didn't go back to, it was like a, it was like a trial de novo. It didn't go back to the, the original sentencing judge generally. And there are other examples of how LA has handled that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I agree with Carlos that judges are who are who have high volume calendars aren't interested in increasing the volume, but there may be ways to you know to handle that so it doesn't impact the, the court quite as yeah. as much. I will just give you some an quasi anecdotal experience with the props of thirty six resentencing. This gets to what Senator Skinner mentioned. Uh, Three strikers who, nonviolent three strikers who go before the parole board are granted about 30% of the time um, <laughs> relief. Nonviolent three strikers who went back to court under Proposition 36 were granted about 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, now, they're slightly different cases. Uh, parole process is handled differently. There's a lot more due process, there's a lot more attorneys involved and litigation involved and probably in the court process. But um, our experience in the Prop 36, which is granted a sort of a unique set, but it was, you know, 3,000 cases, um, folks had a much better chance going back to court. Uh, than that is going the a statewide figure? Yeah. Um, but again, it's discreet and maybe sui generis in some ways, and I don't want to apply that too w widely, but, um, this sort of gets back to the, you know, again, what Governor Brown was talking about, about second look cases, this 1170D process of sending them back to court, yeah. um, in some sort of indeterminate way of bringing them back to court. And who does that evaluation at the end of the day? Um, I think we should just keep on percolating on, or I encourage us. All right, moving along. Um, another idea that came up was, this is to the gun enhancement. There was two ideas, I'm gonna combine these into one conversation that were brought up one is to modify the definition of, of use of a firearm. So for example, and again, we don't have much data here, but as, a, as an unloaded firearm, should that receive the same kind of punishment as a loaded firearm or a, or, or a, a firearm that's not working? I don't even know, Tom, is a, is a simulated firearm, can, can you get an enhancement for a fake gun? I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure okay. there'll be cases on either side of that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's that idea about uh, modifying the definition of what use of a firearm means. And then, of course, there was the idea of repealing the 1020 life idea altogether, keep, which doesn't eliminate gun enhancements, but instead would revert back to the old gun enhancement rule, which was, what is it, 3410? Uh, and I was wondering if people had thoughts about either of those ideas. I think thought that made a lot of sense because one? when the uh, getting rid of the 1020 because <clears throat> when when it was described that you basically went from a three four or five to to a, a, almost an automatic 12 added on it made that you you were in for 15 years at, for sure instead of Anyway, so it, it just made a lot of sense and I hadn't ever, I hadn't thought of it numerically like that before.
other considerations about this? Well, because I'm, any the enhancement makes tacking that on makes whatever you've done a strike. Yeah, I mean, doesn't it? Does it automatically sort of move it to a strike? Does the ten twenty make it a strike? <clears throat> yeah. I, I'm, ah, okay, okay. A robbery without crimes. a gun is a strike. I mean, yeah, yeah both these crimes are strikes to, to anyway. begin with. Are strikes to begin with. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But the gun enhancement. That's hard to imagine a gun enhancement without. <laughs> well, there, uh, there's different gun enhancements. So there's just having a gun and there's using it. And that's yeah. like where the big dividing mm -hmm. line is. And I think any use is going to make it a strike. But let me double check that. I'm also receiving uh, multiple texts from people watching that a fake gun won't satisfy a use enhancement, but would perhaps work for an armed one. So thank you to everyone who's chiming in <laughs> to me about that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, was the, this is different than the 1020 life, but was the other um, code section that <clears throat> Lisa Roth referred to, which was uh, 120.22.53, that mm -hmm. isn't the Estes, is it? That's not the Estes shoplifting. That was something else. The, the, that code section, and I tr always tell our panelists to use the nouns, not the numbers. <laughs> Sometimes right. it doesn't work. That, that is the 1020 life uh, Well, that is section. the code section for the 1020 life. Okay. Yes. There, I think it's 0.5 is just the, the, for lack of a better word, normal okay. use. That okay. is the 3, 4, 10. Okay. So, and I would suggest that there's a couple of different ways to think about this. There's a straight out repeal. That's obviously uh, the cleaner way, maybe more controversial politically, but again, I don't want to get too pop down the road of politics. But again, this is something that could be addressed uh, in the 1385 context, meaning enhancing judges authority to strike these or reduce <coughs> uh, the gun enhancements uh, under certain circumstances. So didn't she also say if the weapon is used, you can't use it on more than one count? That, no, that you could. For, so if there was a robbery with two victims. So I think maybe, she, didn't, she, then didn't she recommend that as an option? Yes. Right. That's, that, I think that that would sort of fall under the pick one, but right. I mean, everybody should realize that if you hold up two people on the street, yeah. that's two robberies, yeah. two, two violent crimes, two strikes enhancements for both of them. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> I think once we get the data and once we see how each of these things or all of this stuff affects in total, it will be easier to discuss this politically. Trying to parse it as to any one of these you know, obviously people don't want to have guns used on them, right? So we can't, it's very hard to discuss this politically in, in absentia, but I think that um, it'll be easier when we have the, the whole picture. I agree. And in particular, I'm very curious to see when we changed, when we went from one enhancement, gun enhancement scheme to the 1020 life enhancement scheme, did that have any impact on public safety, use of guns and other crimes and whatnot, right? Not you know, or was it just lengthening sentences without having any measurable effect to the extent that we can parse that out. So um, I agree that that's important. All right, moving on. Um, great bodily injury is another one of the most commonly used uh, sentence enhancements. It usually uh, results in a three-year enhancement. Uh, I will just say from experience that, again, this is a very uh, open-ended definition about what great bodily injury is, uh, de-emphasizing the word great almost any bodily injury or very frequently that doesn't need to be so great. Other statute, other states and the model penal code have a much more specific definition of what great bodily injury means. Um, and I was wondering if folks thought that this was an area of deserves explanation. It's a quite common uh, enhancement. Yeah. And it also, I would add, makes uh, the fence violent. So it's a strike yeah. on credit, all that. So it's one of these, you know, double whammies or triple whammies, probably. Right. Does the statute define great or the, the Calgic instructions define great? It, well, it, it, it does. And um, it says great bodily injury is 
significant or substantial physical injury. So if that counts as yeah. a definition, then yes, but it's yeah. a little circular, I think. Well, you could <laughs> contrast that with the New York statute, Tom. Sure. Um, let me pull that up. It's, it's much more specific um, and talks about impairment of a person's physical condition, which creates a substantial risk of death or which causes death or serious and protracted disfigurement, protracted impairment of health or impairment of function of any bodily organ. So it's, um, and they also have a, just a physical injury definition there too. So that, that yeah. serious does work unlike our great and uh, use of the word great yeah. in California. Yeah, there sounds almost like maiming. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that would be included, I think. <laughs> Um, well, I will well, just say in the context of plea negotiations, when there's a GBI allegation, extraordinary amount of time is spent on discussing, is this really GBI? Is it not? I mean, I don't know. I would, I think it might be helpful for everyone involved, not only the bench, but the lawyers to have a, a more clear definition of what the legislature considers great bodily injury. You know, and, and on that point, I'll add that California almost adopted that same New York definition, which, as Mike said, came from the penal code or model penal code. Um, and then we didn't at the, at the last minute. Um, but uh, so there's, you know, it was in the air at some point in the 70s, I think. So it wouldn't, <laughs> it, it, we tried it before, perhaps. One of the things well, that I'm I, I, curious about, okay, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I do, just to provide some context um, in response to your question, Judge, you know, the legislature is now sort of looking at um, crimes that are, that just don't involve great bodily injury, but that are also sort of mentally or psychologically injurious. And so I would argue that we're actually moving further in the extreme space. Um, and a lot of this is around sort of sex crimes or, mm -hmm. but extending statutes and then saying you don't have to actually have physical injuries but if you've sort of psychologically been harmed which so that's an answer to your question judge and, and tom correct me if i'm wrong is that there are many crimes batteries sexual assaults that by their nature almost always include great bodily injury but then you get the great bodily injury enhancement on top of it mm just by virtue of the fact that, but it, it, it should be baked. It's, yeah. you know, presumably the severity of the crime of rape is baked into the punishment of rape. Um, but then you get the extra punishment of great bodily injury uh, on top of that. Um, I think that's right. And what New York does, for example, it, that definition that we referred to is part of an element of an offense most yeah. of the time. So it has to be an assault that causes serious physical injury. And that's how you get an assault in the first degree, or something like that. So it's, um, it's, it's a bit of a six and one half dozen of the other, but I, th I think you're right that it seems like it would be a little more transparent to have the elements of the offense re reflect some of those things. Are there other thoughts on the GBI issue before I move on? Um, all right, gangs. Um, this is this is this is a tricky territory in terms of uh, the Prop 21 and two thirds majority. But uh, heeding uh, Senator Skinner's uh, suggestion that we try to, at least at the beginning, talk about what would be ideal policy before we worry about the politics of it. So there was a question about um, should everybody anybody be able to. Uh, Gang, gang enhancements in misdemeanor cases. There seemed to be consensus that this is um, a bad idea. I, mean, I, I raised this issue early on when we were looking for things to talk about. I don't know that it's a pervasive problem. And it sounds like the two counties that were represented yesterday have prohibited the use of gang enhancements to jack a misdemeanor up to a, a felony. Um, but I think one case is too many, quite frankly. And I, I have, in my experience, a couple of cases I remember of kids with no real prior criminal histories caught doing gang graffiti um, that had their, their cases elevated to felonies. It's just the, the, the problem with that is even if the punishment is you know, community service, they now have a felony conviction, which 
in the world of reentry creates all sorts of barriers for a kid that might otherwise have grown out of his, you know, graffiti um, inclination. So I, I think it's, I don't know that we should spend an extraordinary amount of time on it, but it's, I think particularly since it would require a two thirds vote, but it's, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that's always annoyed me, but I don't know that it's a pervasive problem. Well, this is a, this, that's an empirical question that I think our data actually, this one should be able to be, we should be able to find out how pervasive it is. Um, and, you know, it's also so many times we have to remember, you know, 90 plus percent of cases are resolved by plea bargain. And it's not just what anybody ends up with, but it's the threat. So you walk into court and say, they're going to charge you with a felony. You have a prior conviction. That's going to double it up under two strikes. And you may not even be guilty of the vandalism, but take the vandalism misdemeanor. Um, so I, I think we, I think that that deserves some serious thought. I think that some, you know, mechanically under the two thirds question, it's a question about whether or not we could do the same, whether the legislature could do the same uh, idea about striking the, uh, the strike in the using a, a section 17b right which gives judges discretion to reduce felonies to misdemeanors or wobblers to misdemeanors so this is another area that we might be able to if not eliminate altogether give more power to judges to exercise some wisdom here i think there's an opportunity here i just think in this current climate there's so much suspicion around um, the database, around gang enhancements, around how they've been used, around actually how we define them, um, that we have an opportunity to, um, you know, right some of the unintended consequences um, that have resulted as a res and you know, because of it. I, 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 you know, it goes, I, it, I don't think we can say it enough. Also, the racial disparities in the gang enhancement is just, you know, absolutely mind blow blowing. Um, so I, I, to me. I guess I just go back to the fact that if you, you know, if you're arrested and you're charged and if that's the, you, my assumption is that there are like a number of other charges or there, there's at least one other one that's substantive that you don't need these. That's the way I mean, it is in some, in some states, right? If you commit a right. robbery, you commit a robbery. Like that's what you should be punished for, um, regardless of the reason that you commit the robbery. Um, and, and, I, and I would say in tied to that is there's usually a much greater range. So the robbery range might be five to 15. And the prosecutor says, you know, your honor, this was done. There was injury caused. It was done for a gang. So the sentence should be 12 instead of six here. And so it folds in, in a more holistic way. And it's not as mechanical and... Um, I think it's as big of a hammer, though that is a bit of an empirical question. A lot of this conversation obviously is drifting towards giving judges more discretion or guiding their discretion in a lot of their ways. Um, I don't know, I just wanted to mention that. Senator Skinner, did you have a comment? Um, not really. I mean, it, I mean, part of this is going to be ultimately we're going to have to, to discuss clearly how much of this is, how much of what we do should be or is appropriately more discretion of judges, how much of it is rescinding and how much of it is, uh, um, eh, I don't know if there's third category, there probably is. Presumptions, that's yeah. where I sort of think yeah. is, you know, an area that we that we might want to explore in lots of different contexts. There's, there's, there's few presumptions, right? It's either yes or no, um, or wide open discretion right, under 1385, and perhaps there are different areas where we uh, offer presumptions one way or another, um, well, rather than or, making it black and white. Or in adding discretion, putting some belts and suspenders, just because, and we're not talking parole today, we're talking enhancements, but for example, I think um, uh, Judge Moreno, you referenced that the, um, both court decisions and the law already give certain um, 
presumptions to the to parole, for example, which mm -hmm. when we look at the numbers would appear have while it may exist in law, it's one could say it doesn't seem to be being applied. So maybe maybe we need some more. Um, and I guess Brown was really talking on all of these things. If we're going to go discretion, that even within discretion, a little more belts and suspenders mm -hmm. around that. Discretion. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's incoherent that there's so much discrepancy across the state. <laughs> Hi, Dean. Call me song. I'm, I'm having real internet issues today. So if I disappear at various points, I will dial back in. Good to see you. Both at home and now at the office. So, <laughs> but good to see everyone. <laughs> oh. I, so I that's agree. what I Ge thought about. Ge geographic the disparities yeah. is, is, is huge. They're also not intuitive as you might think. I will just go back to, I mean, I'm, you know, three strikes is my main business, my day job. Uh, I will say that, you know, Steve Cooley, the Republican uh, district attorney from Los Angeles is the main advocate for three strikes uh, reform, uh, but we, it was implemented and the main opponent was Mike Ramos, then district attorney from San Bernardino County. And uh, the, the cases in San Bernardino County were all resolved like this. Um, and in, in Los Angeles County, they have not gone nearly as smoothly. Now it's a much bigger county and there are other factors in play. Um, so it's not as obvious as one might think. It's just the conservative counties go one way and the uh, you know blue counties go another way. Um, but I, I do think the geographic disparities is something certainly to uh, look into uh, when we have, especially when there is discretion and wide open discretion, as there is in, in, in um, many of these issues. And he said the governor talked about you know sort of simple creating norms and so if there's such discrepancy in terms of the application of the law depending on if you're in riverside county or if you're in san bernardino versus la you know i mean i think oh, that's a challenge and so how do we also sort of manipulate that in a way that creates some sort of equity I agree completely and, and, and getting a little bit far afield, but you know, uh, one of my things again that we've been working very hard on and that I hope had yields great fruit is the data and data transparency. And I think, and I hope in the longer term, as the state appreciates, sees the data and sees the disparities in counties and judges sees the disparities and, and prosecutors and police, that that, that that will bring some consistency, uh, I hope. Um, just in and of itself, maybe not, or great con corrections. Um, so many of the questions that we have are um, empirical. Um, so, um, well, it's, you know, it's not, uh, well, I don't want to say it's not our purview, though it's gray area, but, you know, a DA Rosen brought up the kind of perverse incentive that uh, while we have various, say, diversion per, uh, options for courts to, say, pursue diversion and such, we don't fund the county for that. And yet we bear the full cost of the, if the county chooses to send the person to state prison. And um, so he was raising that just those kinds of market signals <laughs> that they, that that may impact as may, whatever, that may, so I think, um, I don't know again if we want to touch that, uh, but I think it is, it, it bears weighing, it bears. Oh, no, I, I, I'm actually quite bullish on this kind of idea. I mean, Keely, when she, uh, Basler, when she came and testified before us, mm -hmm. she was very encouraging of some sort of use of the 678 model mm -hmm. or DJJ model, which are these economic incentives right to get counties not saying you can't I mean none of them said you can't send people to prison or can't send juva but it just created an economic incentives for the counties to, to not do it and the response was really staggering and in some ways you know disconcerting I must say that all of a sudden you change the financial incentives for uh, these things and, and the idea of you know who deserves to be needs to be incarcerated changes based on the money is 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 uh, problem disconcerting, but 
And that's why I asked uh, Jeff that question about how does it really work, right? Because the individual probation officer isn't going like, oh, we're going to get more money um, or the individual DA or the individual judge. But there is this free rider problem of the state picking up, you know, the dime. Um, and especially in some of these hard cases. And I think Judge Espinoza, this gets to um, especially the mentally ill folks, right? These are very difficult cases. These are very difficult people for the community. They're very expensive. Um, and I think that we see a disproportionate number. I mean, the data that we've published at Stanford shows that folks who are mentally ill get longer sentences for every crime, from drug possession to murder. Um, now, is it, the, is it our prejudice against people who are mentally ill that we're more scared of them? Is it that they're harder to communicate and work with their defense attorneys? Is it the free rider problem? Is it some combination of all, all of the above? Um, but, I think uh, it's I all of it. Of the, yeah, I think ahead. it's all of it. And I just want to, since you mentioned money, I just want to point out that we've been able to establish in LA County that we can house and care and treat for someone in the community uh, for the average cost of $40,000 a year. That's housing, treatment, that's everything. Um, and it's $600 a day in the LA County Jail for some of those same people to be cared for. And so this may not be the forum, but at some point the state's going to have to take a hard look at how they spend money on this population because I know it's incredibly expensive to care for them in state prison. And we have demonstrated through our felony pretrial program that a lot of people that were on their way to state prison for serious felonies are now in our housing. And we've been able to establish a 14% recidivism rate and 71% housing retention rate with some really sick people. So it is not easy and it takes a real honest conversation about resources. We're having that conversation in LA County every day. Um, but I think at the state level, that conversation needs to, needs to take place because I know that these people are a burden. Our people, our, our patients are a tremendous burden to CDCR. And they don't, they, they don't get good care. We're, str we're straying a little bit of field. Uh, I will yeah. say though that- um, Couldn't help myself. No, 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 it's important. And, you know, listen, this, we only get so many times to meet and it's good to brainstorm amongst ourselves. I want to add also, you know, I want to keep on making sure that we have our eye on public safety and that the studies that we saw, at least from Mia Bird, that was that mm -hmm. people, the public safety outcomes are better um, when we apply um, probation sentences over prison sentences or locally over... Um, uh, now the question of why they're better, but you know, if we, if we can if we can avoid unnecessary incarceration and improve public safety at the same time, that's going to be my sort of guiding star to begin with. Um, one other thing that I think I don't know if it came up yesterday, or related to finances, and this will be my last tangent on this, is if we could figure out um, some sort of 678 on or to encourage 678 on the county level. Did that come up yesterday? No, when but it's come up? up. All right. Well, uh, I, I'll move on. But I think that that's something that we might want to explore. But I think economic incentives, um, I think that there's, there seems to be, at least from the Department of Finance, real interest in this. I would love to work with them as a partner. Uh, and uh, they, you know, Keely and her team, I mean, her, she has experience with CDCR. Um, I mean, Governor Brown said that her predecessor was the person who's primarily responsible for drafting AB 109, which was, you know, the big, the big kahuna here. So uh, I think that there's opportunity there. Um, I would just say that there, based on my work with um, my probation bill 1950, there, there is extreme interest in the 678 funding mechanism. Um, and I think we... Um, not that we proceed with caution, but it, there are um, lots of discussions that need to happen as it relates to that, um, because there are lots of folks trying to sort of manage that. And it's important that we have a guiding star, um, to your point, that focuses on, you know, outcomes um, rather than who sort of gets to control the biggest pot of the money. Total, totally agreed. Um, all right, 